Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm mindful of the time, so I, uh, and I don't want the trap door to open underneath me. So I'll try and uh, get into the topic. Well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share some thoughts today on uh, planning for future quality uh, urban living. And I think Chinam has a really fantastic uh, framework, which uh, probably we cannot cover all because uh, that's probably uh, too long. I will speak on parts of uh, his framework. Well, as a start, there are really a number of key trends and urban drivers that will influence the way in which we develop the urban environment of the future. What's happening in the world? Well, we know there will be an increased pace of uh, rural urban migration, which results in the growth of cities. In fact, cities will face great challenges in providing sufficient infrastructure and utilities, affordable housing, minimize traffic congestion and pollution. So cities are going to face more and more problems. And this morning we talked about babies. Well, that's because the world is aging. Population aging will be a global phenomenon in time to come. And we really need the babies. And it's going to cause us more challenges. At the same time, we see that the world uh, will have a rise of more middle class consumers. The number of middle class will really more than double by 2030. And by 2050, some 70% of the middle income will come from Asia. Why is this significant? Well. Because a larger middle class with rising incomes will start to assert themselves and they expect greater accountability, especially by government, for a higher quality of life, better housing, health care and really reliable municipal services. So I think these are the, the expectations that we will have to meet in time to come. But at the same time, cities really have to prepare for impacts beyond what they can do. Climate change, rising sea levels, extreme weather conditions, which we see around the world. And of course, another trend is that the world will become more digitally and socially connected through social media networks. Convergence of technology and social networks present really excellent opportunities to deliver good municipal services and help governments with better urban management. But what does all this mean for future living in cities? What does it mean for us? Well, I think I'll just pick up three points because there, it means many things for us. I think firstly, cities really need to become sustainable and highly livable in all aspects of live work play. I've also heard the other words like learn or to invest. I think you can add on all these other verbs. But we also need to be more optimal in resource utilization. And finally, uh, we need to be smarter and connected for better urban management. So how do cities address all these challenges? If you look at trends, I think you see more cities starting to take a much more holistic and comprehensive planning approach to achieve sustainable development. And this has really spurred the development of cities which focus on sustainability and technology and to make themselves smarter. So you see cities like Mazda or Tianjin Eco City, whom, which we will hear from, New Songdo City in Korea, and even smaller cities like Malmo, Freiburg in uh, Europe, who are looking at how to do uh, a plan and develop their cities more holistically. Next, cities need to cope with larger populations and densities, and they all are trying to move more towards the transit-oriented development. And this means the adoption of more public transit, shared transit, more green commute, and initiatives which reduce the usage of car. Look at China, the amount of rail lines that are being built. Even London is doing the very expensive cross rail line. They haven't had a line for a long time after the Jubilee line. Another trend, more cities are also emphasizing the importance of bringing back nature and biodiversity into the city. Cities adapt bioprocessors and biotechnologies in their planning and development to enhance the urban lifestyles and the built environment. Cities are also beginning to recognize the importance of ensuring better resource utilization be it in energy, land, water, and food. And of course, cities try to become smarter, serviced by more network and smarter grids. And I'm sure Jeff and uh, Janet Ang from IBM are very happy to hear this because it's more business opportunities. What about Singapore? 
We are only 720 square kilometers. Remember, New Taipei is 2,000 over square kilometers, and that's only a city. But we are also a country. We're a city state. And we have 5.3 million population. I think the latest is 5.4. It's going up very fast. And we have virtually no resources. But over the years, I think the development has taken off reasonably uh, well, and we are generally ranked quite well in many of the indexes, be it in livability, competitiveness, or even readiness to prepare for change. But how is this possible? Basically because we do take a very long-term and comprehensive approach in our planning. We try to anticipate our needs ahead of time. We try to make sure that we have enough land and infrastructure to meet our needs. And we also try to adopt a more holistic approach to our planning, which balance economic, social, and environmental considerations. Well, I don't have time to talk about the planning of Singapore, but I, I do recommend that you visit the URA when you have time. There's a great gallery there. But to better understand how we approach urban development, I'd like to just uh, give an example of how we plan a new generation housing development board or a HDB town. Just a quick introduction to the HDB. We uh, manage about a million flats in 23 towns. We house about 83% of the population of Singapore. And all our residents, 95% own their own homes with only 5% rental. This is very different from cities from all over the world. Given that we house the majority of Singaporeans, it is very important for us to try to plan and develop our towns, which are well-designed, sustainable, and also very community-centric. So take the example of Pongo Eco Town. It's a new generation HDB town. Pongol is basically a very comprehensively planned waterfront town. And when completed, it will have 300,000 residents, 96,000 housing units. And the town will have comprehensive amenities serving residents, shopping, schools, recreation, and very important childcare centers, which uh, uh, Mayor was speaking about. And this also means it's self-contained. You don't really have to commute to the city for services all the time. The town is served by a very comprehensive public transit uh, network, by both heavy rail, which is a northeast mass rapid transit, and complemented by a light rail. So it means that 80% of the homes will be within 300 meter walking distance of a light rail station. We also encourage green commute and we have a car sharing scheme. In addition, it's also about green commute and getting a cycling network up so that we can encourage more intertown uh, cycling, maybe at least to the uh, mass rapid transit stations. An important pillar of the master plan is to bring nature back into the urban scape. The town will have a mantle of greenery ranging from large town parks to smaller common greens. And also, vertical greenery will be weaved in. Not only do we green the town, we want to also capitalize on the blue element of the town. One innovative idea was to transform a very functional requirement into a recreational opportunity. To maximize water storage, we dammed up two rivers and converted it into freshwater reservoirs. To optimize the water storage between the two reservoirs, instead of a functional drainage canal, we created a stream called the Pongo Waterway. And today, this beautiful waterway has opened up new recreational opportunities for our residents for jogging, cycling, or canoeing. We are also introducing water-sensitive design into our projects. This means harvesting rainwater, using the plants to clean the water to process it before they are discharged into the reservoirs. We also want to encourage greater biodiversity through the town by planting the right plants to develop a very conducive ecosystem. So at the same time, we're working with my colleagues in National Parks Board to develop a biodiversity index. Another planning objective is really to create more distinctive districts so that residents can identify with their neighborhood. In our design, we're very mindful to develop more public community spaces for our residents to meet, to encourage more community interaction. So you look at the planning of the town. This is, our, this is social housing, by the way. We have different housing typologies. For example, Waterway Terrace has terrace gardens, which step down to the Pongo Waterway. Housing along the waterfront are designed 
to optimise views. Attractive public spaces will encourage more community activities to take place along the riverfront. A new town square will be constructed and it will have a type of gathering space for large-scale events which are sheltered to facilitate the organisation of events. We are also very mindful, we are very high density, high rise in Singapore. We are mindful that we have to replace the greenery that's lost on the ground to vertical gardens. So we have landscape decks and these are all connected uh, and, uh, and provided with generous amenities and playgrounds. But a town really is not about hardware. It is really about the hardware of the town because it's not about building, it's all about people. We felt it was very important to preserve some of the heritage and social memories of Pongo. So in the design, you'll find that elements of the history of Pongo are weaved into uh, the, the uh, development projects, whether it's a bridge that reminds you of Kelongs. We preserve one of the oldest roads uh, with beautiful heritage trees and convert it into a park, which we will do so along Pongo Road. And HDB really encourages integrate integration of residents and we help to organize programs and activities to promote bonding. Groups garden and farm together and this helps to foster closer-knit communities. We have regular dialogue sessions with uh, our residents and they are roped in to co-create the environment. We also encourage active citizenry. In fact, a Pongo Waterway Activation Group programs the use of Pongo Waterway and we have become for Pongo, the Venice of Singapore. So having looked at all the planning of aspects of Singapore, I'd like to just share a little bit about the science behind making Pongo more sustainable and smart. Pongo is really a living laboratory for testing many urban solutions for our new generation of towns. We focus on sustainable initiatives covering energy efficiency, urban mobility, uh, water, resource and waste, and maintenance. So energy, we look at, for example, uh, solar power. Urban mobility, we're looking at, uh, uh, for example, shared commute. For water, we have many water-efficient uh, fittings built into the buildings. Uh, we do rainwater harvesting, resource, and waste. We actually introduce an additional centralized chute for recycling, which has increased the recyclables by four times compared to our, our towns. And of course, we're looking at uh, better maintenance and cheaper maintenance. I won't go into this because there's a whole story on its own. We're also test bidding the use of smart meters in some of our projects so that residents better understand their pattern of energy consumption and will hopefully modify their lifestyle and behaviour to save more energy. We are now exploring the use of pneumatic refuse collection systems and we're going to introduce this uh, in the next couple of years in one of the first districts. This is a very complicated diagram but to to cut the long story short, basically we have a sustainable framework which guides the development of the town and we're developing a complex urban modelling system which is a decision-making support tool which will help us to get the optimal balance in adopting the various initiatives that address sustainable management of water, energy, transport, waste disposal and soon to come even the modification of the human behaviour. Again, this is another talk on its own. I won't go into detail, but uh, this is about using technology to help us. We are also carrying out what we call environmental simulation on wind, flow and heat, which are key parameters affecting thermal comfort. When we plan a town, we actually run the computational fluid dynamics program through the town to look at cooling down the town because we are in the tropics, we need natural ventilation. We look at it not at a building level only, but the entire town, and we modify the design to capture and maximize breezes. We look for hot spots and we reduce it by planting and landscaping, for example. So these are some of the things we do. Smart applications and solutions. I think there's a lot more scope to look into this, and it could cover smart home living, uh, smart precinct governance, and even smart town planning. 
Using centralized remote monitoring systems, we can actually collect, manage and analyze data centrally. We are already doing this for our solar uh, PV, data collection and analysis, but there's a lot more we could do for other applications in future. So for example, we can leverage our big data and sensor technologies to help the elderly and put in place an aging in place telecare platform. Well, basically, maybe smart living will mean that you can keep an eye on your children at home so you can have more babies, don't worry. <laughs> All right? And you know your father can consult the doctor from home without having to bring him to the hospital or the clinic. And your energy bill goes down, you know, because your home is smarter and it modifies your behavior. You're more careful about energy consumption. So basically, I think cities really face many challenges but they also provide the opportunity for us to develop new and very innovative urban solutions, particularly by harnessing the power of technology. But we must not forget that it is also about developing solutions that will enhance community interaction to build social memories and for building relationships. Both hardware and software are equally important so that we can develop a quality urban environment, but also an endearing home. Thank you.